and that will pick up the sound. So this is Kyle Rankin. He works for Linux, writes for Linux Magazine, and wrote several books about Linux and done many other things. So why don't you take it away? So if I full screen the browser? Uh, yeah, we'll record this, and you can just use anything you want there. That's a good title. Yeah. Um, Sounds like you want to make a full screen. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's see. Uh, is it a PDF? No, it's just a web browser. Um, just the green, uh, the green dot should do it. And that full screen or just okay. That should be pretty close. Yeah. I'm getting up. All right. All right. All right. So, hello everybody. So my name is Kyle Rankin. Um, I, by day, I am the chief security officer at a company called Purism. Uh, we make uh, security and privacy focused laptops um, that run free software. Uh, I also write for Linux Journal, um, and I've written a lot of different books uh, about Linux. Uh, most recently I wrote a security book called Linux Hardening and Hostile Networks. Um, there's the URL for this talk, so if, you, know, you don't have to furiously write notes, you just furiously write down the URL. It'll also be on the last slide. Um, then you can see all of these notes, you know, all of the talk uh, bullet points um, going forward. So first thing to note is that when you're talking about passwords and password cracking and that sort of thing, um, I gave this talk at a password cracking um, uh, track at a security conference at one point. This, this talk is aimed at all audiences. I don't assume that you have, that you have a password cracking rig at your house that you have any sort of advanced knowledge or password cracking. This is an overall general purpose talk for everybody. Um, so here's what we're gonna talk about, just a brief introduction to why I'm giving the talk. Um, then I'm going to talk about RMS, so Richard Stallman and the great MIT password revolt. Um, then I'm, we'll discuss the golden age of computer passwords, the dot-com boom and what I've sort of termed the password renaissance. Uh, then talk about, uh, or sorry, dot-com boom and the password policies that they, um, Spawn uh, that we all hate, then XKCD and the password renaissance. Uh, then I'll talk about a modern password cracking um, and sort of some semi-modern techniques for cracking passwords. Uh, then we'll cover some of the new approaches for passwords that have spawned from the password cracking that we have. Uh, finally, we'll talk about uh, two-factor authentication and how that can help uh, discuss password reset attacks, uh, which sometimes are even easier than cracking a password, and then some general conclusion and then some questions. So um, in general, if you want to hack an account, the best way is to guess the password. So they've been the weakest link in security for decades. That's the main way that people would get into your, to your system, get into your accounts. Uh, usually when people talk about uh, passwords and, and cracking passwords, especially in the security community or IT community, People, the first finger that they point is at the user. That stupid user picked a bad password. It's their fault that they were hacked, et cetera, et cetera, right? People always say that um, because it's easy to blame the user. I'm here to say, and the whole purpose of this talk is to say it's not the user's fault. I say it's the IT and security industry's fault, largely. They're mostly the one to blame because the security community for decades has focused on theoretical password attacks. Um, almost exclusively and given advice based on theoretical attacks, uh, but they've ignored how real users would interpret their recommendations and use their recommendations. Uh, so as a result of focusing on theoretical attacks, they've passed down decades of really bad password policy that, they, that have been claimed as best practices up until two years ago or even last year. Um, some of these are still documented as best practices for a lot of government policies. Um, and so that trickles down, right? If you have a, a best practice that's been published in say the PCI spec that everyone who, who is in the credit card industry must follow, then an IT person is going to check that box and make sure that that policy is in place, whether it makes sense or not. So this talk, we'll talk about first, how do we get here? How do we get to the situation where we're, we all have pass, password policies that we hate that don't work? Um, what are the current threats against passwords that are actually out there today? And then based on that, what can we do? What is a good password then? Um, and what are other alternatives to passwords that can help strengthen passwords? 
All right, so computers didn't always have passwords. Um, it's kind of weird to think about that because the, one of the first things, if you interact with almost any system now, it asks you for some sort of authentication. But um, computers didn't always have passwords. In fact, uh, passwords weren't always viewed as a good thing to have. I mean, we sort of think of them as a, as a necessary thing, but some people thought of them as a bad thing. Um, so Richard Stallman, he's, you know, most well known for uh, the GNU project and for the for Free Software Foundation and promoting free software, things like that. Um, he viewed passwords as a means of control, not as a means for security. So most people know about him because of free software, but they don't know that RMS is also a password cracker. So um, he joined the MIT AI lab in 1971, and they built a system there in the AI lab, and that um, system had no passwords. And in his own words, he said, we didn't have any passwords. The reason was that the hackers who'd originally designed the system realized that passwords were a way the administrators could control all the users. So they just didn't do it. They left that, they left that feature out when they were writing the software for this lab because they didn't want admin to come in and control everybody. Well, eventually uh, they put passwords onto the machines at MIT and I didn't like it. I figured out how to decode the passwords, so I sent messages to the people, all the other users saying, hello, I see that you've chosen the password mumble or whatever their password was. Uh, how about if you just type enter for your password, it's a whole lot shorter. And so he did a couple of things by doing that. One, he revealed that the security measure they had in place for passwords were weak. He was able to reverse it, reverse it and, and reveal their passwords. And two, get people to go back to the original system that just had an empty password. And he said he was able to get about a third of the members of that lab to have an empty password based on this scheme. All right, so then we move on to now everything has passwords. So let's talk about the golden age of computer passwords. So in the beginning, um, computer passwords were like ordinary passwords. So passwords didn't begin with computers. Uh, passwords uh, started as a way to have a shared secret between two groups of people or two people in general. Um, so, for example, speakeasies during Prohibition in the United States, you would have these illicit clubs that would sell alcohol illegally. Um, and, and to get in, you had to knock on the door and they would ask you what the password was. And the past, you know, what's the password, see? And you'd have to say, you know, um, you know mumble or whatever the uh, password, uh, whatever the password was for the day. And sometimes they would rotate. In fact, there's a speakeasy here in San Francisco um, called uh, Bourbon and Branch that has the same sort of thing. Every day they have a rotating password. You knock on the door. If you want to get in, you have to say the password for the day. Um, if you say books, then they take you to the library. Um, early on, a lot of computers didn't support passwords longer than eight characters. Uh, and also, some computers couldn't handle case, so they ignored case. So in that, in the, in that case, pun intended, um, password lowercase and password uppercase were the same. You could enter either one, and it was treated as, as the same um, password. So as a result, passwords were typically just single words. If you only had eight characters to play with, there's not a lot of creativity there. Most people picked a single word. It was usually simple, and it was usually very easy to guess. Uh, for the most part, people tended to all pick the same passwords. Uh, if you only had those restrictions, certain people always sort of congregated around the same words. So you might say, okay, well, what were the most commonly used passwords? Uh, this started becoming part of hacker lore. If you wanted to be in among hackers, parts, pieces of knowledge that you would pass around were commonly used passwords. That was something you memorized and tried. So for instance, uh, popular things were love, sex, secret, God, all were very popular. Um, well, and of course, password. Password has long been a very popular password uh, to use. So if you wanted to hack somebody back in the golden era, all you would do is you would just try every word in the dictionary. Eventually, one of them would be their password and you would get in. Uh, the problem is that would take a long time and sometimes it would be too slow. So if, it, if that's too slow for you, um, then what you would do is you would just sort of guess some words important to them. Uh, that was sort of like the, the, another part of, of hacker skill was learning about a person and guessing important words. So um, commonly people would pick their spouse's names, their pet's names, their children's names. If they have a sports team that they like, the name of their sports team. Uh, this is also the main way that people get hacked in movies. Uh, so for instance, um, if you wanted to get into the Seattle Public School District, their password was pencil. Um, if you wanted to log in to the, the Whopper mainframe that controlled the Department of Defense, uh, the password was Joshua. If you wanted to get into the Gibson supercomputer, the password was God. Um, 
So, you know, golden era, what ended up happening is um, people started developing tools to automate this instead of having to guess dictionary words all day long. Tr tools like John the Ripper made this very easy and fast to do. You would provide it a file full of words from a dictionary and it would iterate against those words and try to crack passwords that you had. Um, as computers got faster, as they always do, so did these attacks, so they were able to be, to be faster. So as a result, IT departments started creating password policies to help protect um, their passwords against some of these attacks um, that were able to crack some of the weaker passwords. This is also the era where you started having centralized Windows ad administration tools. Uh, so we're talking about things like, like Novell, networks, um, software, uh, Active Directory and Windows, things like that, that were allowed you to set policies centrally. Um, so as a result, if you had a way using tools to set a policy centrally and deploy it on all of your computers in a company, you're more likely to do it. And so you start having these checkboxes for, would you like to set password policy to limit the number of characters, things like that. And so they started deploying it. Um, all of these password policies originally were well-meaning. The idea was we want to protect our users and we want to stop people from picking easily guessable passwords. Um, but they were misguided uh, because the password policies that they created had this, they didn't think about how users would interpret the policy and what passwords they would pick based on the policy. Users generally hated them. Um, and users still hate them. If you've ever worked in any sort of uh, company that has ever had centralized IT that has a password policy, or if you've ever logged into any website that judges you based on your password and tells you it's weak or strong or kicks it out because it's not complex enough. You probably hate that and you should because uh, it's a bad way to do things. So here's a couple examples of some policies uh, that would be common in the era and some problems with them. So minimum password link. So here's the policy. Passwords must be at least six characters. The idea behind this is it makes a dictionary attack take longer. If you know, uh, if you're going to go through all the words in the dictionary, uh, you can't, if you, have, if you have a really long, if you only have words that are very long, then all of those short words, you know, you have to skip those. In theory, if you did the math on this, you would have between one and 300 million password combinations, which sounds like, well, that's an awful lot for someone to have to compute, um, depending on what the password was. But users picked QWERTY, secret, password, and one, two, three, four, five, six. All of these perfectly match the policy, no problem. And attackers just went to their dictionary and removed all the words that were shorter than six characters and then tried the rest and they got in. So IT saw that, they responded, they say, okay, that's fine. We're going to increase, we're going to add password complexity. So instead, in, in addition to saying it must be at least six characters long, uh, they must also contain at least one uppercase letter. The idea here is um, it increases the total number of password combinations. One, and two, it removes passwords that are just numbers. So one, two, three, four, five, six, never again. You can't use that. Um, you have to have at least one uppercase letter. In theory, if you do the math, this increases the theoretical combinations to 19 billion. So that, I mean, you're t when you start getting into numbers like this, you start hearing people talking about atoms in the universe turning into computers and being used to compute and brute force things. And so it sounds like it's an impossible thing. Uh, users picked QWERTY, secret, and password in the uppercase, the first letter. Um, in general, if you ask someone to, that you, if you tell someone you must have at least one capital letter, they're going to always uppercase the first letter. Attackers used their dictionaries and they uppercase all the first letters and then they tried them and they got in. IT said, oh, well, those stupid users, they keep picking these horrible passwords, we're going to solve this with policy. Next policy is, Passwords must contain at least one uppercase letter and a number. Why? Again, it increases the total number of com combinations. If there's at least one number in there, it increases it up to 57 billion combinations in theory, if you were to run the numbers. Again, sounds like a lot. Atoms in the universe, impossible, right? No way they're going to get in. You, yes? Are you talking about eight um, character passwords? I'm talking about six character passwords in this oh, case. Six. Yeah, we're still staying to six. So 57 billion combinations, if you have at least one uppercase letter, lowercase letters, and one number, in theory, you can have up to 57 billion passwords out of that. Because a character set is, um, what, 52 plus 10, so that would be 62 um, times to the sixth. So what did users do? They picked QWERTY1, secret1, and password1. You ask a user to pick to add a number, they're going to a number and they're gonna put it at the end. 
attackers added the number zero through one to the end of all of the dictionary words and then tried them and they got in. They're like, aha, we're gonna stop this silly thing where people just put numbers at the end. Passwords must contain at least one uppercase letter and two numbers. So why did they put this policy in place to stop users from just adding a number to the end? You know, you've got to stop them from doing that, obviously. The theoretical combinations are still the same, 57 billion, because the characters, you're still using the same number of characters, you're just forcing them to have two numbers. What do users do? Purdy 84, secret 69, password 11. Um, what did attackers do? They added two digits to the end of dictionary words, and they got in, <laughs> right? Um, the other thing that they did was attackers started adding uh, significant two digit dates if they were guessing your password. So if they knew something about you, they knew that you liked the Giants, and they knew that you were born in 1979, then they would guess Giant 79. If they knew that your wedding anniversary was a particular year, they would use that year, um, things like that. Because people typically, if you give them two digits, if you give them one digit, they're gonna pick the number one. If you give them two digits, they're either going to pick one, one, 69, or they're going to pick some year that is meaningful to them. That's just how people are. So then IT said, okay, well, we gotta stop this. Uh, people are cracking our passwords. Computers are getting faster. It's the user's fault. We're gonna stop this by saying passwords must contain at least one upper character, one number, and one symbol. Getting very serious here. This adds some order of magnitude to the entropy of the passwords. Um, it also stops users from just adding a number to the end, numbers to the end, because those stupid users, um, not obeying our, obeying our policy, but picking these bad passwords. Um, in theory, you get 782 billion combinations by adding um, common symbols plus the other uppercase, lowercase numbers. Again, a lot of combinations. No way you're ever gonna crack that. Uh, impossible, hackers will never get into your account. People pick 4084 bang, 69 bang, and password 11 bang at the end. Um, this is what I refer to as a password mullet, uh, which is uppercase in the front and numbers and symbols at the end. If you ever have this password policy, people are, will gravitate toward the password mullet. Um, attackers, they added a couple of symbols, usually just an exclamation point and a couple of other symbols to the end of all their dictionary words that they already had. Um, and that was pretty much it and they got in. Because again, if you tell people to do a symbol, they will pick an exclamation point, they will always put it at the end. One or two clever people might put it at the beginning, but they're in the minority in any way, an attacker really just needs to get into one account. All right, so then, now we have lead speak. So this, is, there's, a, there's a problem when you start asking people to pick uppercase, lowercase numbers and all of this stuff. It's really hard to remember a complex password. You know, you have all of these weird sim symbols and all of this stuff, it's hard to remember. So IT people said, okay, I have something really clever. You're gonna be able to remember these crazy passwords that we make you come up with, you silly users that are always just putting exclamation points at the end. Just do what we do, which is lead speak. So you take a dictionary word, you apply lead speak to it, and bam, you have an uncrackable password. Um, so for example, password becomes password with, so what, what lead speak is, is it's a transformation that hackers sometimes have used in chat where they, instead of using um, all letters, they would replace some letters with numbers. So an A might become a four, an S might become a five, zeros become, uh, or O's become zeros. And so that's password and lead speak, all right? And if they get really fancy, um, if you need symbols, they might do something like that, um, where they use an ampersand, um, or the at symbol, sorry, not an ampersand, the at symbol instead of an A things like that. Maybe put an exclamation point at the end. Um, so that's like your super lead speak password. And this was actually an actual administration password uh, that at a previous job of mine. Um, turns out attackers know lead speak too. Um, hackers invented lead speak. And it also turns out it's not that difficult to tell a computer to take a dictionary word and apply this common transformation, search and replace to it, and then try it. So they got it. You know, there's certain apps that generate so like uh, password management apps mm -hmm. that they generate long complex password 16 or, or longer digit combination of them. I'm just curious, what, what, and it must be that the same algorithm because it, it, do you have any idea like what algorithm that they use or how practical it is? 
a good password manager should be generating that randomly. So what they'll do is they'll, um, often they'll have a tick box where you can tick off what the password policy is. Does it, does it, must it have numbers? Must it have letters right. and symbols? Once like, you tick that off, they take all of those combinations. Um, let's say, you know, either 62 or, you know, 82 or whatever, however many, um, however big the character class is. And then say I need a, a 20 digit password, it will randomly pick from each of those. Uh, from that character class 20 times. And so it's truly random, or it should be. So this is my least favorite password policy. Um, and this is uh, the most hated one. Uh, it's called password rotation. So the idea is passwords must be changed every three months. Well, meaning the idea was, well, people are cracking these passwords so fast. I don't know how they're doing it. They must have, uh, they must have turned every atom in the universe into a computer and used it to brute force these passwords somehow. Um, but if we change our passwords every three months, if it takes them a year to crack the password and we change it every three months, there's no way they're going to guess all of these passwords. So we're stopping them in their tracks. Uh, the other reason is they believe that by rotating the passwords, it limits the amount of time the hacker will have on the system. Somehow if the hacker gets on the system, then you change the they guess the password, then in three months you change the password out from under them, the thought was, well, now they're locked out. They're not gonna be able to get back in because you just changed the password. How are they gonna guess the new password? So users picked password one bang, and then they picked password two bang after three months, and then they picked password three bang. Um, so it, it actually, this isn't just me saying this. Uh, there was a study done um, in the, I, I wanna say about 15 years ago at a university where they studied what passwords people picked if they had to rotate passwords. And what they found was they were able to predict your next pass, if they knew your current password, they were able to predict your next password with about 70% certainty because you would use a similar scheme every time. Attackers guessed your weak password they learned what your scheme was, so they were able to guess future passwords, and then they put in a backdoor within hours of the hack. So attackers typically aren't going to hack your machine and then say, okay, well, I will just use this login I have. Usually they will add a backdoor because they know eventually you're going to discover that they got in and close the front door. So, as you might tell, there's some problems with these password policies. So basically they're bad for everybody but hackers. They're bad for IT because, and this is something that's not talked about a lot. A lot of people talk about how horrible password policy is for users. Um, but it wastes an enorm enormous amount of IT time troubleshooting password and account lockouts. Um, so I used to sit across from the, I the help desk team at a company. And you could tell, I would get to the office early, and there's always, in a password rotation time, there's always at least one person standing at that cubicle waiting for the help desk team to get in because they went to the office early that day, they got locked out of their account because the password rotated on them, and they needed help with the IT team to um, unlock it. And this happened every single cycle. There's always at least one person, if not multiple people, going to the help desk because they got locked out. It's a, it, became a, it becomes a huge burden on IT to have this kind of policy, especially rotation policy. Um, it also frustrates a user that picks what they believe is a legitimately hard password that gets rejected. This happens to me all the time. I pick really good passwords, passphrases for a website somewhere, and they will say, oh, this isn't a good password because it doesn't have a number or whatever. You know, it's like a, a 25 character password, um, and they'll reject it because it doesn't have a symbol. Like, you're kidding me. Um, if you're someone who tries to pick a really good password, like, okay, I can remember that, and it's a really good one, and you type it in and your system rejects it, it bothers you and it frustrates you. Um, also, if you actually did pick a really complex password and then you know in three months you, it, you have to rotate it. So you pick a complex password, you memorize it, you get really good at it. Within a week or two, your muscle memory kicks in, you start typing it and it's no problem. Then in three months, you have to change it. Then you're kind of bummed out. You're like, okay, well, I guess I have to think of some other really hard password to meet your silly policy, memorize it, and what ends up happening is after about the third time, you're not gonna bother with that anymore. It's really painful to rotate complex passwords. Um, what this does is it leads to people putting passwords on post-it notes, which again, people would blame on the stupid user always putting their password on the post-it note, but the reason they did that was because they were forced to create unmemorable passwords because of these horrible password policies. Um, it also encourages the user to pick the weakest possible password that technically meets the standard because they're having to memorize these things and it's really complicated. So they just pick the weakest password. 
Uh, as a result, most passwords to this day um, that aren't generated by, that aren't a passphrase and aren't generated by a password manager are some dictionary word, so some kind of predictable transformation on that dictionary word, whether that's lead speak or adding numbers to the end and a symbol or whatever. Um, hackers are still able to guess the majority of the so-called complex passwords that meet these policies. Okay, so then we got into what I call the XKCD password renaissance. So XKCD, this um, geeky web comic, uh, great comic, released this, this is a number of years old at this point. He released this comic that sort of captured the notion of all of these crazy passwords we had to remember and the fact that they were hard to remember but easy for computers to guess when really you should be picking passphrases uh, that are like, in this case, correct horse battery stable, uh, which has a lot of entropy, is easy to remember, um, but hard for a computer to guess. Well, that, not that one in particular, that one's in everyone's dictionary. Um, so ne don't pick correct horse battery staple, but something like that. So focus started shifting away eventually from these weird complex passwords and the passphrases that were long. Uh, so for example, my personal, if you were to ask me to give you a corporate password policy that I think is reasonable, my policy is 12 characters minimum, which seems like a lot, it's a long password, but no rotation, ever, we won't rotate the password, no complexity requirements. So I'm not forcing you to pick numbers, I'm not forcing you to pick upper versus lower, I'm telling you 12 character minimum, no complexity requirements. So, so the reason I say, yes, yeah. yeah, I say 12 for a couple, I pick 12 for a couple of reasons. One, well, I think I say why here. Um, so first, theoretically, theoretical combinations is 95 quadrillion if you pick a 12 character password. If you're gonna talk purely on the numbers, let's just do the theoretical attacks, which as we've shown isn't a great way to measure things. But for people that have to argue that way, 95 quadrillion. So that blows away even eight character super complex passwords that are like bank industry standard kinds of things, right? Um, for like the eight character mixed case numbers and symbols that your bank forces you to use is only 7.2 quadrillion combinations. So 12 character lowercase, you know, if you just say 12 character whatever, you just pick whatever, 95 quadrillion. If you don't rotate the password, you encourage the user to pick a longer, so when I give this policy, when I've given this policy out in prior companies, to say it's 12 character minimum, but that's the minimum. I will not rotate the password out from under you, so please feel free to pick a longer password, but once you memorize it, that's it. I'm not going to change it out from under you, unless for some reason there's some great break in technology where 12 characters isn't good enough anymore. Yeah. Would there be no upper limit? If you have 12, well, I only have 35. At some point, is that, you have to build that in. The, the downside, the, the unfortunate thing is some systems do set an upper limit on passwords that's, that's too short. I've seen systems that kick out at 16, for instance. It's really annoying. Some kick out at eight. Um, some silently kick out at eight. They will truncate passwords longer than eight because Behind the scenes, if you were to trace all the wires, you end up at a mainframe running COBOL, and uh, it can only handle eight character passwords. Uh, but yeah, that ideally, uh, you would accept at least like 64 characters or some nice round binary number, right? So, but if you, if you say, I'm not gonna rotate, the user's encouraged to pick a complex mm -hmm. password. Um, a passphrase could be a, a song lyric or a movie quote. It turns out people say, well, it's hard to remember passwords, but there's, five or six songs that all of you have every word memorized by heart. Um, there's movie quotes that everyone will quote every two seconds or some sort of TV quote, may the force, you know, uh, you can fill in the rest of that sense or whatever it is. There's some phrase that you can memorize. That is a reasonable password for a reasonable attacker that you can remember. I'm gonna talk, there's an asterisk to that. I'm gonna, there's a caveat to that I'm gonna talk about here in another slide. Um, or if you're concerned about that and you have high security needs, uh, there's a, a, a scheme called Diceware, where you have this, uh, it provides a dictionary full of uh, English words, and each word has a six digit number next to it. You take uh, six die, um, you take six dice, you roll them, and whatever number comes out, you go to the dictionary, you look up that word, you write it down. You do that five more times, six more times, and you have five or six randomly generated words that you then memorize. That passphrase is, is really hard to crack. Um, the combinations are ridiculously hard to crack. 
So that's a very secure way to generate a passphrase. The, the fact of the matter is it seems complicated, but your muscle memory will take over pretty quickly. I have passwords that if you were to ask me, I don't even really know what they are. I just know what they feel like. You know, after a while of typing in the same password, um, your fingers sort of take over. So it usually takes a week or two if you have a complex password, but you'll find that you're not thinking and trying to remember the password. Your, your fingers are kind of doing, typing the password in. Um, but you know, I'm just somebody giving a presentation and if you, were, if you are under one of these um, regimes of horrible password policy, you say, well, I went to a talk by a guy who said, you're wrong. Um, and then I'm gonna say, well, who's this guy? Why should I listen to this guy? So fortunately, you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, new NIST guidelines. Uh, so that's the government we're talking about here. Discourage password rotation. They discourage complex passwords and they encourage passphrases. So here's the, here's the perfect, here's the ideal phrase here. Verifiers should not impose other composition rules. So that's password complexity. Um, on memorized secrets, verifiers should not require memorized secrets to be changed arbitrarily example periodically so that's password rotation so they're saying you should not do that so if you have an IT department that does this you can print out the slide take it back to them and say well, I'm, I'm sorry that you don't like best practices I mean the, the government says that you're doing it wrong all right so let's talk about cracking for a little bit What's the private sector say? I'm sorry what does the private sector say? Uh, it really varies um, for the most part, the private sector is the parts of the private sector that are under a compliance regime, like PCI or something like that. Um, they are the password policy that they use is dictated by that. So PCI is still under the old school eight character mixed case complexity must be rotated. PCI? Sorry, a payment um, card industry. So it's it's the if you are processing credit card if you're processing uh, payments using credit cards things like that, then your systems have to abide by the security standard. Um, there's a lot of standards like that out in the industry uh, that certain, if you do certain types of business, you are required to comply with those standards. And so some of them pass down these policies. Other places, it's just this accepted wisdom that's gotten passed down from IT. And some of it's from best practice documents that they might get from Microsoft or, you know, based on Active Directory, they might go to a talk from someone that says, well, you know, tick these boxes off in Active Directory to have good passwords, things like that. So the problem is it's not, there's not an accepted, everyone does it this way. There's a couple of different blends of rules. Right now, the most common one that's old, that's old school that shouldn't be done, but is common is a character, mixed case, require numbers, require symbols, and rotate every three, every three months. I obviously think that's horrible. Uh, but that's the most common one you will run into. So modern password cracking is, uh, uses very sophisticated tools. It's very advanced. Uh, it's actually a sporting event at DEF CON. Well, it used to be a sporting event at DEF CON. And the way that it worked, um, the contest worked, is they would get these big databases full of hashed passwords using one-way hashing. And the teams that could crack, the, the team that cracked the most passwords in the short amount of time won. And they would bring these complex password cracking rigs that had all of these GPUs with customized software. And I gave this, the first time I gave this talk in front of a crowd, um, at the end someone walked up to me and said, by the way, they don't do that contest anymore. I was like, oh, is that right? He's like, yeah, so I used to be in that contest and we stopped doing it because it, um, we, they canceled the contest because it was too easy. Uh, everyone was cracking too many passwords. So it's no longer a sporting event at DEF CON. It's just a sporting event in real life. Uh, so. Most password cracking starts with a hashed password dump. As you might imagine, if you're trying to log into Twitter 50,000 times, they might notice. Um, what ends up happening usually is someone will hack a site, um, get access to their database, dump the entire contents of the database that contain hashed passwords, and then aim their password cracking software and hardware at that database and try to guess passwords. Sorry, uh, so, uh, sorry for not explaining that. So normally it's, uh, while some people still do it, it's considered a bad practice if you were to give your password to a site for them to store the password as you typed it in their database. So if, you, if your password was password, um, for them to put the password stored in the database in plain text without any encryption. So hashing is a kind of encryption that um, only works in one direction. So 
if I take your password and apply some this algorithm to it, it turns it into a long string of digits um, that only works one way. It's very difficult to take that long string of digits and turn it back into your password, but it's very it's relatively fast to take your password, apply that algorithm, and convert it into those digits. So the way that it works is the database stores that stream of random digits. When you log in, they take your password, perform that math on it, and then it gets that output. They compare that output to what they already have in their database, and if they match, then they let you log in. Um, that way, if some, someone cracks the database, they get this long string of encrypted text that they can't immediately see what your password is. They have to, do, they have to work for it. Um, so the way the password cracking works is they have a list of dictionary words and things they want to guess. They apply that math and see if it matches. And they just do that millions of times a second and eventually, hopefully, get a match. Um, so uh, because they start with a database dump, this lets an attacker take this offline, um, try to guess passwords on their own time, on their own hardware without the, uh, the victim noticing. Uh, there are tools uh, like Hashcat, which supports um, not only a lot of different algorithms that people use to hash passwords, so that math, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, they also allow you to point to huge dictionaries, and serious password crackers have enormous dictionaries full of every, you know, all these different combinations of words. Uh, they also, Hashcat supports transformation patterns, so what you can do is you can say, take every word in this dictionary, or these dictionaries of billions of words, and then try those, and then apply lead speak, and then try that. Or they can say, try, take every word in the dictionary, and then also add two numbers to the end, and try that. Uh, things like that. It's amazing. Um, as a result, they can, you know, your so-called complex passwords that in theory would take billions and, or, or quadrillions of guesses, they are able to reduce that down to a very small number of guesses because they're guessing just the most common uh, most likely things. They're not trying to guess every random string in that combination. They're starting with dictionary words and then adding to manipulating those dictionary words. So the number of guesses they're trying may be only, a, you know, 500 million guesses or a billion guesses instead of, you know, quadrillions of guesses. Uh, there's also a, a, a version of Hashcat called OCL Hashcat, and that can use your graphics processor, which is a lot faster than your regular CPU, uh, to, do, to, do, uh, to accelerate it. So if you use your graphics processor, you can do way more guesses in a second than if you were to just use a regular CPU. Uh, so for instance, I tried this out. In 2012, I wrote an article. This is, so again, this is like, what, six years ago now? Um, I decided I wanted to write a article about password cracking and how to do this. So in 2012, I, I bought a $280 um, graphics card. And back then, um, that for $280, I could get a graphics card that could do 350,000 guesses of MD5, which is a hashing algorithm that is no longer hopefully commonly used too many places, but back then it was still used in a lot of, for a lot of sites. It could do 350,000 guesses per second. Right, so if you assume I want to guess, you know, a couple million, if I wanted to do a couple million guesses, that wouldn't take that, that machine very long, and it didn't cost me a lot to make. Nowadays, the number's way higher. People have very sophisticated rigs um, that can do way, 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 way more guesses. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about the rock you hack. So um, the fact is most people end up reusing passwords across sites. If you can guess, attackers know this. So what they do is if they hack a password on a weak site, they pick a, a vulnerable site, they hack it, they guess some passwords. They see your username, which is usually your email address, um, your password. What they do is they then go to popular sites like Gmail and other places and try the same combination. They say, well, they use this password and this username on this site, I bet they use it on more than just this site. So they, once they guess a password once, they go to every other major site on the internet and try it and see what works. And it often works because people usually pick the same password for multiple sites, although you shouldn't. Um, if the attacker can get access to your email account, then what they do for the accounts they weren't able to guess, they trigger a, a password reset on Twitter or whatever, which sends a handy little email to the account they just owned, and then they don't have to guess the password, right? They now have access. So in 2009, there's this company, RockU. Um, 
And what they did was they provided, um, this is in the age of Farmville and all of these, you know, apps that were running on Facebook. Uh, so they provided, they were a, a company that created apps that ran on Facebook. And so they had, they were hacked and that hack exposed 32 million different user accounts. Very big hack at the time. Problem was they stored all their passwords in plain text so they didn't use the hashing that we were talking about. So as a result, when the hackers got this database, they just had 32 million users worth of passwords, all in plain text, sitting there to look at. This became a treasure trove of popular passwords to try everywhere else. Up until this point, people just had to kind of guess about what were popular passwords people were using these days besides password, because everyone knows that's the most popular one. Um, this helped prove that though. People started performing statistical analysis against this database and said, it turns out password one still is the king of all passwords. Um, but then they started rating the commonality of all this. And then they started coming up, what's even better is some people had really good passwords, right? But this were, it was in plain text. So now people had really good passwords that were in active use on, in the real world and probably use other places. Everyone immediately added this database to their dictionaries and tried it everywhere. So over time, there's been more database dumps as people have gotten hacked and these uh, databases get released to the public and, and people who crack passwords for sports start cracking them. Every time they crack a new hard to guess password, that wasn't already in their dictionary, they added to the dictionary to try the next time. So as a result, all the really advanced password crackers are adding to their database every single time and they get bigger and bigger. Um, the cracking itself is getting faster, it's getting more optimized, the tools are getting better, the hardware is getting faster. Um, attackers want to crack every single hash, they don't want to wait. So. Um, Attackers are adding even more and more exotic dictionaries because it's not good enough just to crack 85% of the passwords in the database. They want to crack 100%. So in 2013, again, this is you know not that long ago now, or the, I guess this is a couple years ago now. So think about the state of the art. Um, they describe an article where crackers were using the Bible, uh, Wikipedia, and YouTube comments uh, to feed their dictionaries because they were there were passwords they couldn't crack otherwise. Using the, these sources for dictionaries allowed them to create really complex and they cracked some crazy passwords, such as give me liberty or give me death was a password that they cracked using those as dictionaries. They also cracked in the beginning was the word. Again, that's like a hard password. They were able to crack it because they used the Bible and Wikipedia as a dictionary. Um, so what this, what this demonstrated is that in certain circumstances, passphrases, um, if you pick a passphrase and there's a chance it might exist on the internet at large, that could be at risk, um, which isn't great news if I, you follow my advice a minute ago, which is to pick a, move, a song lyric that you know. This, it's iffy. So I'll talk about what makes a good password here in a minute. I still think it's okay to pick passphrases to a certain point, um, but in any case, we'll get into that. So, so what's a good password? A good password is a password you can't remember, unfortunately. <laughs> Sorry. Bad news, everybody. Um, <laughs> it's very long, 20 plus characters, truly random and complex. So random string of digits, won't memorize it. Almost impossible, you'll memorize one. I mean, the human memory is actually very powerful. You know, like Alexander the Great was known to have memorized all of Ulysses, right? Um, was it Ilya, sorry. Um, not Ulysses, that's a different author. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so he was he memorized the entire the entire play, um, uh, the entire poem. But you know, so our human memory can do this, but it's very difficult. And if you ask people to do that, they're probably not going to do that. Um, oh, also do that and use a different password for every account. That's also something you actually legitimately should do. Um, this is all impossible. I'm asking you to do very difficult things. So it's hard to do this. So use a password manager. That's what password managers are for. Password managers make this easy to do, this hard thing to do, easy to do, all right? So really you do suggest a password manager? I, I do, yeah. Pick a password manager, that makes it very easy to give every single site its own password, it, tell it to generate the password for you so it's truly random. You don't even have to remember it, you just know, you just have it locked down in your, in your password manager, yes. What's a good password manager? Oh goodness, uh, so that's, so I like, uh, KeePass, or there's a family of password managers called KeePass. It's, it's open source, it's, like, it's free software. 
Um, it's a local password manager, which means it runs across all the different, you know, Windows, Mac, Linux. Um, it's local, which means it just sits on one machine. It's not sharing your passwords to the cloud anywhere. So you don't have to worry about whether it's encrypting it properly to share on the cloud, um, although it does use strong encryption. Um, and it includes a handy little password generator. Now, there are, and it's free. Um, there are a lot of other, the, the downside to a password manager like this is that it's local to your machine. So a lot of people don't just log in to a site from their computer, they use a phone. They might have two computers in a phone or whatever. Um, so there are password manager services like LastPass, 1Password, um, that are cloud-based. Um, and there's a pro and con approach there. So the, the po on the positive side, it makes it easy to synchronize your passwords across all of your devices. Um, they're optimized for logging into websites. So it makes it very easy to log into all of your websites and use different passwords. It's very easy to use. The downside is um, you are storing all your passwords on a third party. If, that, if they were to ever go bankrupt, you'd have to figure out what to do. Um, or if they had a security breach, that would be a concern. So that's, you know, it's, there's a trade-off. Uh, so that's whether what I would, I like using local um, password managers like KeePass or family, but I also understand why some people, that's not a good solution for them. Um, of course, you have to, yes. Uh, it would be hard to crack for um, password crackers who um, don't who don't speak that language. So you would be it would be harder to crack in the, that case. Oh, you're you're up. One second. One second. One second. I like that idea. Hold on one second. Um, so the thing is, some passwords need to be memorable um, because, for example, your password manager to unlock it, you have to type in a password. So you can't store that password in the password manager. You know. Um, so you have to remember something, right? That's the part. Whoa, I hit a thing here. Unlock. Okay. Sorry, I hit one of the things. Oh, hey. Oh, wrong one. Wrong one. Okay. Sorry. This is me. Okay. Here we go. Um, so you have to remember some passwords, unfortunately. So how strong should those passwords you remember be based on all the things I just said? It depends on what your threat is. So I still say 12 character average or, or greater passphrase, no complexity is good for your average threat, your average password you have to remember. Because again, you, not just your password manager, but you, you have to log into a machine sometimes. Sometimes you have a disk encryption phrase that you have to type in, things like that. So this is reasonable, I would say. Um, for advanced, if you have an advanced threat, if you are under attack and you really are concerned, then I would say a five to six word diceware password, that's where I said you roll, you roll dice and you um, look, at, look up the words. Um, or pick a passphrase that's memorable, but one that wouldn't exist on the internet. So you have to figure out what that would be. Um, if you speak multiple languages, um, mix and match. So pick parts of your phrase from one language, parts of your phrase from another language. Um, computer languages count too. So if you are a programmer, you can pick some English words and some programming words. Why not? Um, all right, so that's passwords. Uh, but the thing is passwords sometimes aren't sufficient. There's other things that we can do to help make our passwords and logins even stronger. So we're gonna talk about two-factor authentication. So there are three main categories of authentication. Um, there are something that you know, there's something that you have, and there's something that you are. So passwords are an example of something you know. It's, it's, a, it's something stored in your brain. You memorize something. Um, the best insurance against password cracking, in my opinion, um, in addition to the other steps I said, is two-factor authentication. And the idea behind two-factor authentication is that in addition to the password, which is something you know, you also need to provide some other factor that comes from a different category, so that's not something you know. So for example, something that you have, something you have might be a key of some kind, a token, your phone is often an example of something you have, or something that you are. And something you are, biometrics is usually what's meant by that. So fingerprints, uh, DNA, your signature, um, you know, for example, on your credit card. Your credit card um, often, some transactions on a credit card use all three of these factors. So one, you have something you have, which is the card. You have something that you know, which is the pin. And then something that you are, which is your signature. The idea is your signature is supposed to be unique to you and not forgeable by something, someone else.
Um, the great thing about two-factor authentication is even if the attacker cracks your password, they have this other hurdle where they also have to figure out how to compromise your 2FA method, whatever it is. Usually it's a thing that you have. Um, and for the most part, most two-factor um, two authentication methods, um, these days that you run into are usually a form of something you have, the second factor is something that you have. Usually not biometrics. Usually if you run into that, they use all three and biometrics is one of them. So here's some examples of two-factor authentication. What about, you know, um, if you're doing thumb versus retina, isn't it always the deal, like, you know, that's not a great idea because then someone may want to just take your thumb? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, I have, I could, I could do a whole talk on, on how I don't really like biometrics. So of the three factors, you know, something you know, have, and are, um, I think biometrics is the weakest of those um, for a couple of reasons. One is the fact that um, it's not a secret, for the most part. Um, fingerprints aren't secrets. Um, imagine if you wrote down your password on a post-it note and left it on sure everything you touched, right? Well, um, it also turns out that anyone, I, I have a copy of your face right now, you know, and if I took a picture of it, I also have a copy of it. Um, your fingerprints you leave everywhere. All of these things aren't exactly secret. Your DNA, like one day people will have DNA for authentication and think it's super advanced, but you leave your DNA everywhere. Um, bad idea, right? And so, and so here's the thing. And the other problem is, so that's one problem. The other problem with biometrics is that it's hard to revoke. You can revoke a fingerprint authentication um, 10 times, right? Um, then you're done. You can revoke a retina scan twice at best. Um, it also is not very good for accessibility. Some people don't have fingers. What are you supposed to do, right? Um, so that said, um, for example, a lot of phones, you will use your, your biometric your fingerprint or your face to unlock. It's the weakest form of authentication, in my opinion, but it, it's, not, it's still stronger than nothing which most people, a lot of people, if faced with the option of having a passcode or nothing to unlock their phone, um, would pick nothing. And so it's better to, in my opinion, to use a fingerprint, which is way more convenient um, than a passcode, um, than nothing at all, if that, those are your choices. Now, I still think using a passcode is better for a lot of reasons. All right, sorry. I, about, like, I think they can make it better. What they can do is like, you have to kind of choose three fingers. It could be any three fingers, you know, and the scan could be like this, you know, this way. I think that's part of the problem. Is that you're assuming like just one finger. If it was three, you have to figure out which three fingers. I mean, so yeah, sure, I mean, you know. yeah. So I'm, I'll end my biometric rant here. Um, if you want to hear me rant about it more, we can talk after. Um, I'm happy to do it more. Uh, so anyway, let's talk about the, some of the most common ways of doing 2FA with something that you have. Uh, so um, one of the most common is SMS. So the way that this works is you log in. And then you'll get a text message back that has some sort of six multi-digit code and you enter in that code. And the idea is um, only the person who has that phone should be able to have that six digit code sent to them. And so it proves that you have the phone in your possession. So if an attacker guesses your password, they don't have your phone. So it sends a text message to you, not them. Um, it, of these options that I'm going to list, it's the weakest choice. Um, unfortunately, hackers are starting to, there's certain methods out there to intercept SMS. Um, there's one of them is a flaw in the protocol itself that telecoms use, that cellular providers use for SMS. Um, the other flaw is that attackers are finding it very easy now to, um, to get your phone number transferred to their phone. Uh, this happened, this sounds far-fetched, but it happened to a friend of mine. He was complaining one day that, hey, my, I'm not able to, my, my phone's not working, so contact me through some other means. And I pointed out to him, you should check to see if you've been hacked because you should change your passwords because someone's taken over your phone. And sure enough, they had. They had gone to uh, the local you know, Verizon dealership or wherever and convinced them that they were him, lost their phone. Could you please transfer my number to this phone? Oh, yeah, sure, happy to help. Um, and they did. So, then, so that's, that's the other problem. So that's a problem with it. Um, Still better than nothing, though. A lot of people in the security community will, will go against um, this sort of thing, but the thing is, it's still better than nothing. Actually, there's another way. Uh, I could just, you know, if I'm a pickpocket, take your phone, take your chip, put my chip in your phone, and now I got your, your number. Sure, yeah. So it's better than nothing, yeah. um, but, it's, but, it's, but it's the weakest of these options. Yeah. 
Um, the next option is a push notification sent to your phone. Um, sometimes you'll have a vendor that says install this app. Uh, Duo is a popular choice for this, where you have this app on your phone and when you log in, it sends a push notification to your phone and you accept it and then it says it's okay. Um, I, like, I like that method because it's very convenient. Um, instead of having to enter in a code and worry about all that, you just say okay and, it, and it's fine. Um, unfortunately, the security of it depends on the security of the phone. So if your phone's hacked, um, then potentially they could intercept that. If also the strength of the security of the app itself, whatever app you're using for this function, if it's hackable, then it's less secure. Um, next option up is TLTP. So this stands for time-based one-time password. Um, what this does is if you've ever seen this, what will happen is Google, a, co a common, common uh, form of this is Google, Google Authenticator. So with Google Authenticator, you'll log into a site and then you'll go to your phone and start and look on your phone and they'll have this six digit code that every 30 seconds changes. And essentially there's this secret that you have on your phone that the server has and you both take that secret, apply the current time to it and you get this and it converts into a six digit number. Um, if those numbers match, you get in. And the idea is only your phone or your, your device that, has the, that generates this code should have the secret that makes it. So this is a way to prove it, prove that you have the device. This is very secure um, because it uses this shared secret between the server and, and you. Um, and you can use either a hardware token often that has this, or you can do it implemented in software. I like this approach, it's very secure. And finally, there's something called U2F, Universal Second Factor. And the idea here is it uses a key that's inside of a hardware token, like a UV key, or there's all these different tokens that implement this. Think of it like a USB thumb drive. If you have a thumb drive, um, when you log in, it says, insert your thumb drive. You insert your thumb drive. It sends a challenge to, directly to the hardware. The hardware um, proves that it has a secret, sends the, challenge, sends the response back to the server, and the server says, only the person who has this thumb drive um, could respond this way. So I authenticate you. It's very secure, it's very simple. You don't have to enter a code or anything. You just have this thing, you plug it in and it works. Um, it's not implemented in a lot of places. Um, for some, you know, universal second factor is not universally used. Um, and, it, and it sometimes depends on browsers, like Chrome and Firefox and major browsers now all support it, but it's not being used everywhere yet. Um, but it is, it is a good choice if you can, if you can do it. All right. So the thing is, uh, passwords aren't always the weakest link. We've been talking a lot about how it's the easiest way to get in, but it's not always the case. Sometimes it's easier to, account, to attack an account using the password reset function that the account has. So the way this works is you, through some means, get access to the user's email account, maybe guessing that password, or they leave their machine unlocked or something like that. When you, once you have their email, um, then you go to the site that they want you on login, trigger the password reset, the password reset comes in to the email and then you have access to their account. Um, if you do have two-factor authentication, that can help against this attack in many cases. Um, in some cases, the attackers um, can potentially go to that site and socially engineer them to um, turn off to a face. Think about it this way. I have access to your email. I've lost my password. I go to a your bank or wherever and pretend that I'm you and say hey I'm sorry I, I lost my phone and I can't get into my account could you please I, I, I got a new phone I lost my old phone I need to reset my 2FA could you turn it off for a minute and if you're convincing enough you can convince them sometimes to do that and then you can reset the password turn on new 2FA or not and then you're you're in um, another option, um, of course, all this ties into email. Facebook is saying, well, why should, only, why should everyone just use Gmail? Well, you should be using Facebook for this instead. Um, sort of like a, not really a battle, but it's sort of like, you know, who do you trust more for security, Facebook security team or Google security team, right? Um, so Facebook is saying, well, you should, you should just use your Facebook account, which is we have a lot of security. We have smart security people working here who have a, who protect your account. Um, so they've created something called delegated account recovery. And what that does is, uh, if you have a site that supports this, um, when you want to reset your password, instead of sending it to your email, it would communicate um, behind the scenes to a Google or to a Facebook API. And then face, you would log into Facebook and say, yes, allow, reset my password. Um, 
So I kind of said that. Uh, it's a new protocol, it's still in a closed beta, so we'll have to see whether that becomes a long-standing option or not. All right, so in conclusion, um, it is possible to have strong authentication today. Uh, unfortunately, the security community can't really agree on what that looks like yet. Everyone's still sort of arguing about what a strong password is. Um, we also, generally speaking, still repeat all of the mistakes today in the security community that led to bad password policy to begin with. Um, and by that I mean, uh, well, first, it's important to note that attackers have always focused on real users from the very beginning. They were focused on, okay, what is a real user going to pick as a password? And they've always think about the user's impact on security. Unfortunately, um, defenders haven't always done that, but it's time for defenders to do that. Defenders have long ignored the real use, the user. And for example, in the security community, researchers often just sort of focus on hacker movie type attacks, you know, or the government's out to get me and I'm gonna focus on that threat and all of this crazy stuff. Um, and at the expense of thinking about what a real world user using an account is going to do. Uh, so researchers sort of need to shift their focus away from theoretical movie attacks into real users. Um, IT, um, it's very easy if you are in IT to say, well, what's the check boxes that I have to check, especially for security? I'm required to do these things. Okay, did that, did that, did that, and not question it. Um, uh, IT needs to start questioning these so-called best practices. Uh, it's way more work. So, you know, I worked in the in industries that required me to comply with PCI. And so I was, you know, it would be very easy to check a box. I needed to do some of these password policies that I think are awful. Um, but I took the extra energy to fight that and say, I think this is bad security. I'm going to use this policy instead and demonstrate that it's stronger and then get what's called a compensating control for that. But it takes effort and it's a lot easier to not do that. So, but to make the world better, IT needs to, um, to, resist, to resist just checking it off and needs to fight it. But to do that, you have to have better security education across the board. You have to sort of empower IT to understand why something maybe isn't a best practice. So um, that requires good security education for everybody. Um, and finally, I would say stop blaming users because it's not their fault. Um, they're just doing what you told them to do. All right, so additional resources, including some of these uh, things I referenced. So any other questions? What about the login? Like, just making the login longer, how much cut would that be, 30% of improvement versus just having a better password? Um, it's, the login's not a secret, no, so. Like, you know, if you have you know, 10 users with similar you know, logins, you know, making it somewhat longer, that helps you with only 10%. I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to apply a percentage. I don't know. I don't think the I, logins aren't a secret, really. So I don't know that having trying to pick a weird login would necessarily help you, um, because when they get the password database, your login's right there. Um, so they're just trying to get your your password's the thing that ideally in a database should should be encrypted. They typically don't encrypt your username. So. Yeah. yeah. So um, I want to ask you in terms of a application platform scenarios where all these applications is being integrated on the same platform and and they all have to use the underlying password you know which is talk to one another mm -hmm. whether it's Microsoft leverage the LDAP or the next local or global password account. So what is you know your take in terms of like what you just said I mean I do get it from the user so if if I understand your question, you're sort of asking me about how to apply a sort of a password policy to a to sort of a central password store that many applications. So are users still logging in, or are you talking about applications that are authenticating to each other? Oh, in that case, you can get away. So I mean. One, one approach is to use TLS for that. Um, so TLS, uh, Transport Layer Security, is a protocol that if you, you, know, you log into a website and it has a little lock icon, HTTPS, you know, it's using this protocol to both encrypt the communication so people can see and also authenticate. So, um, I, I, I'm actually talking about applications like um, this platform, for 
example, and then all these applications to integrate with one another. The application itself, when you configure it, there's there's a form not for the user, but it's the developer who have to enter password in order for this part, this feature to work with like database, and this this feature work with you know the other applications. So user never get get, get to see that. And that's a vulnerability because if the hacker can get it, they can basically crash your crash your okay. apps and then I'm talking about like the ones who make big big uh, uh, enterprise application platform. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the answer. Might be something that we could take, you know, after at the end. Yeah, I mean it sounds like you're kind of talking about how to how to protect access control lists, like how to sort of design a system with access control lists between applications to have so certain applications have privileges that others don't and, and things like that, maybe, but we'll, we'll, we'll take it after. Yeah. What about keeping um, password files, it's got your random passwords, it's an encrypted file, mm -hmm. you frequently use, and, and then you go on random stuff you memorize. How good is that? And uh, you're crazy long and complex. I mean, yeah, I, that sounds great. Uh, I mean, that's before there were automated password managers out there. I mean, a lot of security people still use a, an encrypted text file that just contains their passwords. The only downside to that, if it's a downside, it's just every time you want to log into a thing, you have to open the file and all of those passwords are still staring at you, you know, and they're visible because you're having to copy and paste them, you know, put them in the clipboard and stuff. Um, so from a convenience standpoint, um, a password manager that's local to the machine is also encrypted um, and would make it easier with you know keystrokes to um, organize that but but that's perfectly secure if you use good encryption on the file and strong passphrase to unlock it or strong keys yeah yeah Other questions? yes let's say you have a dictionary attack and you've got you know, thousands and thousands not even millions of attempts so at what point does you, your what you want to log into surreptitiously does it say hey We've got an attack going here. You know, please, please use the wrong password five hundred times. You know, go to room one hundred and see somebody. Told you that. Sure. Yeah. And so, how, what, how, is that written for the word of the day generally with these various? Yeah, and in fact, some policies require that sort of thing. Um, account lockouts after a certain number of failed attempts. Um, you'll get things where either after a certain number of attempts have failed, they will um, pause and sort of reset and make you start again so they slow you down or they will lock the account completely. Some policies require that. And so a lot of sites have some form of that and how many attempts before they lock you out, it varies. Um, but even like a, a local Unix or Linux system often will have that. If you guess too, too many times um, incorrectly, it either locks the account or at least like resets the login. Um, but most of the attacks I'm talking about, people will, um, base it off of a database where full of hashes so they can do it offline. So they're not testing it against, say, you know, like Rock U itself, they had the database. Well, that was plain text, they didn't have to crack it. But, um, you know, if they get a database from a, a, a company they hack, they then on their own computers in their own time, crack okay. it. So, okay. so it's not noticeable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. I've logged myself out a couple of times. Yeah. Here, I mean, the, the junior college. So. Yeah. What effect do you think uh, GDPR and um, EU compliance will have on passwords? Well, um, it's I think it's causing sites like um, like potential. Some people have said that today's Twitter password reset may have resulted from them actually looking at what they were logging to make sure that they were complying. I don't know that that's true, um, but some theories were oh they were finally looking at what they were logging to see if they were complying with GDPR and saw that there's some passwords in there, whoops. Um, that's not necessarily what happened, uh, but that's what, so I don't think because, I don't, I don't think that it'll have a direct impact because it has more to do with how and whether you store people's data, uh, personal data, uh, but not their password. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it doesn't necessarily apply to password storage. Yeah. Other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Is the website up? It's, it's right here. It's right there. First, oh. first link. Yeah. yeah.
So uh, make sure you put your name on that if you want to get credit. This is the last talk in the CNET 10 series, but there's another one coming next week with just a, it's worth extra credit if you go to it. Um, and uh, that's it. Good to have you. Oh yeah, this is in my computer. You can. I just stopped recording. And, uh, <coughs> It's not like it's uh, IP restriction, but US IP restriction, this is your gateway, you change your gateway, we're not going to